been looking for the past two classes at the proportional integral derivative control. And we've been focusing very narrowly on one particular aspect of the control. Today we're going to look at different aspects, and then after this we're going to look at how we select the tuning for the control. So let's just quickly put up what we know so far. So far we've been deriving a transfer function model for the system where we're given a set point, and that set point is going to drive the controller. The controller is then going to try and achieve the set point, and it's going to do that by taking our process over here. So we start this a little bit lower. So here's my process. We call that GP. So my process GP receives a manipulated variable from the controller. Let's work backwards. Our process a manipulated variable that comes from which we call GC. It sends a manipulated variable to the process, and it does that by doing some calculation on the error. So this error is developed then by taking the set point and it subtracts the set point. Sorry, it takes the set point and subtracts from the control error. There's my control variable, and we fed this around <coughs> long diagram. So we're very comfortable with this representation. Now. We've seen it many times in the past few classes. The key thing I wanted to emphasize here is, I mentioned this last Wednesday, that that process is actually a representation of the L it doesn't really exist in practice. It's our best guess of what the process is. So GP of S is only a model of the process. So it's not the actual process. Now, consider the following situation. Let's take an example. Consider this room. There's a set point for this room. Somewhere in this building, someone has a set point set for this room. Let's say it's 23 degrees. Okay. Or if it's not this room, it's maybe your apartment or your wherever you stay. There's a set point for the temperature in that building. That set point is fixed. For most of the winter time, you're going to leave it at 23 degrees. You don't change that. <coughs> Yet, we have furnaces in our basements, or this the university campus has a physical plant over there that develops heat. And that's a manipulated variable. So if my set point never changes, why do we have a manipulated variable coming into the process? Why do we need to put heat into this room? So this is the temperature over here, the control variable. Where are those outside factors? On this block diagram, where, where are those outside factors? This model is telling you what is going to happen if you change the manipulated variable. So that would be, for example, the amount of gas that you send to the furnace, okay, or the amount of steam that you send to the radiator. So the manipulated variable is a thing that's actually changed to adjust the temperature. So it's, this process is simply the transfer function or the model that tells what happens when you vary the manipulated variable, what you're going to see happen to the temperature. But where is the temperature effect due to these outside variations? Where, where is that represented? It's not yet on the transfer function diagram. We don't have it there yet. Okay. 
Okay, so we, you're not missing anything. Here. Here's another example. You're riding, um, you're driving your car, you've got your foot on the gas pedal at a certain angle. Okay. And your goal is to keep going at 110 kilometers an hour. You've got your foot on the gas pedal, you're going 110. If you keep your foot at, on the gas pedal at that angle, are you going to go at the same speed all the time? Not necessarily. So there's your manipulated variable, is your angle on the foot on the gas pedal. Okay. So that's your manipulated variable, is your angle of your foot. The control variable is your speed. But Danielle is saying, despite keeping your foot at a constant angle, you're not going to keep the same speed. Why is that? Terrain changes, there's maybe wind blowing against your vehicle. Okay. So there's something else affecting speed here that we haven't yet accounted for. We need to add something to this control variable value to make it represent reality. And that's our goal this morning, is to say what is this fund we're going to add? <coughs> the source, the biggest, we can see more clearly at the back. Our goal is to say, I want to add something so there's a plus and a plus, and it's that combination then that is going to be controlled. Something else is coming into my system that I've not yet accounted for. And that's our goal this morning, to understand that. We call those things disturbances. These things coming in is the effect of disturbances. So let's uh, do a little bit of math here, a little bit of recap. This is this interleaving concept I've mentioned before. We're going to go right back to the start of the course and do a little bit of a long derivation here. A bit of algebra, but there's a reason for it because we're going to use this example. And it's an example we've seen before many times in this class where we've got the flow of cold water coming into a tank. We also have the flow of hot water coming into a tank. FC and FH coming into the tank. We're mixing that material up and we've got to flow out to the temperature. So we've seen this example many times. The temperature has been my controlled variable in the past. Let's see, this was my CV in the past. And my manipulated variable in the past has been this flow of hot water. We call that MV. And in the past, I've said, let's assume this flow of cold water is constant. That's not changing. But I'm going to take that assumption away today, and we're going to see how that becomes our disturbance. So this flow of cold water is going to be my disturbance variable. We're going to add to the flow. So we're going to see how both the flow of cold water and the flow of hot water affect the temperature. We know intuitively what the flow of cold and hot water will do to the temperature. We know if we add more hot water, our temperature is going to rise. If we add more cold water, my temperature is going to drop. Okay, we, we expect that in our final answer. So in the end of our derivation, we need to check that that actually shows up. So let's go and do a little bit of mass uh, energy balance. So, so energy accumulated energy in minus energy out. And we've got energy in coming in from two streams. The two flows in will bring some energy into the system. Energy out leaves from that outlet temperature. And so energy accumulated, we can say, is going to be rho Cp times the volume of the tank times dt by dt. That's my accumulation. Then I've got flow of energy in. Well, that comes from the cold stream and the hot stream. Let's do the cold stream first. There's the density of the cold stream. is just rho as well. We're going to assume that that's constant. Times the flow of the cold water times the heat capacity of the cold stream times the temperature of the cold stream. So let's call that Tc. Add two new variables to this diagram. Tc is this temperature 
of the old street and th is the temperature of the hot street. We're going to assume that those temperatures are constant. We don't want to make this too complex. We're simply saying the flow in fc and the flow h are varying. And when they vary, that temperature out is going to vary. But to make our life a little simpler, we're going to assume Tc is constant and Th is constant. So that's my energy in from the cold stream. There's energy in from the hot stream. That's rho times Fh, Cp times Th. So energy in, flow in from the hot stream. Energy out from the overall system is rho. But this time, we've got the total flow out is Fc plus Fh. So that's my total flow out. Leaving the tank is Fc plus Fh times the heat capacity times the temperature of the output stream. So that's easy enough. Um, let's go and take a little bit of simplification. We see that rho and Cp appear in every single term in that equation, and it's constant, so we can cancel all of that out. So that's our, our first simplification. Not going to write that out. Um, well, maybe let's put it up here on the board so we can see and work from here. So if I cancel out, I get V times dt by dt is equal to Fc times Tc plus Fh times Th minus Fc times T minus Fh times T. So I'm going to expand that last term over here. Here's my problem now, is a nonlinearity that's developed. So Tc is constant, so this term here is linear. F Fc is the only varying term. In this term, Fh is only varying, but here both Fc and T are varying. So this is nonlinear, and that's nonlinear. So we need to go do a quick linearization on that before we proceed. So Fc times T can be linearized. We can say that those two nonlinear terms are going to be approximately equal to their steady state value, Fcs times Ts plus we keep one constant and then the other vary, so that's Fcs times T dash plus T constant Ts times Fc dash. So that's the standard linearization for, for that. We can go do the same for the Fh term. Let's quickly write it up here as well. Fht is going to be Fhs times Ts Fhs T dash plus Ts times Fh dash. So we've expanded each of these purple terms, the purple underlined, to three new terms. So now we're going to get a little bit of a mess here. We're going to get three plus three plus the two first ones. We're going to get eight pieces on the left and on the right hand side. I'm not going to have enough space here, but you'll get the idea that if we sub in these linearized versions, we're going to get a fairly long equation, v by dt by dt, v times dt dt, is fc times tc plus fhth. Okay. And then let's sub in that linearized version, minus fcs ts. <laughs> Fcst dash minus Ts Fc dash. And then I like this. This is due to the first expansion of the term. And the next one is minus Fh S T S minus Fh S T dash minus T S Fh dash. So those three terms are due to the next non-linear. What's the next step? Steady state. So steady state, the left hand side is zero. The right hand side simplifies quite nicely to FCS. 
So at steady state, that Fc becomes Fcs. Tc is constant, so that uh, doesn't change. Fhs is constant, is a, at steady state, you call that Fhs times Th, which is constant. <coughs> Minus Fcs, that first term in the expand, nonlinear expansion is already at steady state. At steady state, T dash is equal to zero. So minus zero, Fc dash is zero. So that's another minus zero. Minus Fhs, Ts is already at steady state. Minus zero, minus zero. <coughs> Times S 
So we get so b times x. And we'll get multiplied by t dash of x. But what I'm going to do just before you write that down, notice here's a t dash of s on the right hand side. I'm going to take the Laplace transform of this term and bring it over to the left hand side. So collect all my t dash of s terms up here. This is standard, right? So t dash of s, and I'm going to be able to write b times s plus fcs plus fhs. So all those terms are collected up because they're a function of t dash of s in front of them. Remember t dash of s, that's the temperature leaving the tank, that was my controlled variable. That's why it's over here on the left hand side. So back in this example, that my controlled variable was the temperature. And my manipulated variable was fh. Okay. So you can see why I've collected the terms like I have. This is my output temperature. We want to understand how temperature is going to be affected by two things, the flow of the hot water and the flow of the cold water. Those are the two terms I've isolated. The flow of cold and the flow of hot. So let's continue that uh, Laplace transform and simplification. I can take the Laplace transform of this first term on the right hand side. That's Tc minus Ts. Okay, and Fc dash of oh, s. So we take the Laplace transform of that. And then the second term there represents the effect of the hot stream. So plus th minus ts times f dash of h. Simplify then and write this as t dash of s is equal to tc minus ts divided by the volume of the tank times s plus, let me introduce just one term to help simplify things a little bit. The flow of the cold water coming in plus the flow of the hot water coming in, that's my total flow. We'll call that F. That's constant as well. It's a constant value, FCS, FHS. So this is the total flow of F subscript X. So then in these denominators I have V times S plus the total flow of S. multiplied by the flow of the cold water in the deviation form. Plus I have a second term now developing TH minus TS divided by the same denominator, V times S plus FS. Perhaps rewrite this a little bit differently, and you're going to see immediately how this matches to the transfer function representation that I've left over there on the left hand side. We can now write this and recognize that the temperature is my manipulated, is my control variable, so Cv of s is equal to, let's leave this first term for a minute, let's come back to this last term which is very familiar with us. Or to us, FH, remember, was my manipulated variable. So that numerator there, I can write that as KP for the process gain divided by tau PS plus 1. It has that form. If I divide through by FS on the numerator and the denominator, I can get that 1 over there. And FH of S is my manipulated variable. F h of s is my manipulated variable, t of s is my control variable. 
And now you can see what Fc is doing. Fc, remember, that's the flow of cold water. We had originally said it's constant, but that's your disturbance. This is the thing that's going to make your control system work, even if you're not making set point changes. And how does it do that? Well, let's introduce some notation here. I'm going to call the numerator kg for the disturbance time constant, sorry, disturbance gain. And the denominator is tau d for the disturbance time constant plus 1. And that's multiplied by fc dash of s. And I'm going to call fc dash of s something new now. I'm going to call this simply lowercase d. That's the effect of my disturbance. In other words, lowercase d is simply fc dash of s. So let's go update that block diagram that is over here on the left hand side. We want to update this block diagram now and look at the effect of disturbances. Well, the way we do this is to go add in this extra term that's developed over here. This over here, and the purple represents the effect <coughs> of disturbances. And this block over here, the second block, represents the effect of the manipulated variable. So you can see my control variable, the thing that I'm interested in keeping at set points, that control variable is going to be affected by two things, the disturbance and the manipulated variable, the two components. And it's a summation. So when we sum up over here, that controlled variable is equal to the sum of two parts. Well, the first part comes from the process. We're very comfortable with that already. The second part, let's take that and add that to our diagram now. This is the effect of disturbances. I'll add it in purple to match what's over there on the right. So this is coming in. It's just another block, simply another transfer function, kd divided by tau d s plus 1. And the input to that transfer function is d of s. Before, did we just have it as one term? I'm just wondering why like, all of a sudden now we get this different result. Before, all we said was fc was constant. And if c is constant, this whole term disappears, and you get to back what we had <coughs> So I've intentionally done this. Thing. I've not spoken about the disturbances. We've assumed that the process would have no disturbance. So if you look at Dr. Marlin's book, when he talks about control systems, he'll introduce both the disturbances and the set points simultaneously. I've chosen not to. I've chosen to ignore the disturbances and come back to it. A different approach, different way of thinking about it. <laughs> okay, so there's my disturbance now on the block diagram. Let's just quickly make sure that this derivation we've done makes sense. Remember, we said that if we increase the cold water flow, what should happen to the temperature? add more cold water to the system, the temperature is going to drop. Does this transfer function show that? Increase the flow of cold water, what's going to happen to temperature? Does this transfer function make sense? Yeah? No? Take a look here. There was FH, uh, sorry, FC was over here. CC was the temperature of the cold water. <coughs> and this is the hot water flowing in. That's the temperature FH. Sorry, TH and the flow of FH. And 
and this temperature leaving was T. What was Ts again? Initial temperature Ts at steady state. So Tc minus Th. What's the sign of that? Ts? What's the sign of that? Negative. Tc minus Ts is negative, indicating that Kd is negative here. So my numerator gain on that disturbance is a negative number. In telling me that if I increase the flow of cold water, temperature will drop. Make sure that the gains make sense. Always check at least the very least the sign of your gain. Minimum requirement always. Your gain sign must make sense. That's what you expect. So Tc minus Ts is that. I'm just going to divide it in here by Fs, and that's term Tc minus Ts over Fs. That is, in fact, what Kd is equal to in the numerator, tau d in the denominator. That is equal to tau d is this term over here. That's V divided by Fs. On the process side, for the effect of the manipulated variable in the process transfer function, the box is red. TH minus TS. What sign is that? Positive. You increase the flow of hot water, temperature's going to go up. This numerator must be a positive constant. So TH minus TS is positive divided by a positive number, the flow of S, and we call that KP. So KP is that expression. And that tau p is equal to the volume v divided by fs. Here's an interesting thing. Notice that the process time constant, tau p and tau d here are the same. The process tau time constant tau p is v divided by fs. The disturbance time constant tau d is v divided by fs. So same dynamic for the disturbance as the process in this example. Make a note of that. These are the same. <laughs> tau D and Tau P in this example are the same. They're not always true for every process. It just happens to be that for this case. Okay, so then we made sure that my, my numbers K, KD, tau D, and tau P make sense. The last thing I'd like to do is just to generalize this a little bit and use the notation we're always going to use going forward. Let's just take this last equation here and just write it in the general form that we'll use. CB, my output variable is a the sum of two parts is the, the disturbance model is G D of S. So that's the process transfer function for the disturbance times the disturbance itself plus the process model. So G P of S, we can't call it G P of S, that's not nothing new, times M D of S. So that the second term is very, very familiar to us. So this first term is the new part, and that's our focus of today. <coughs> and in the past, we haven't seen that because I've assumed that that disturbance is zero. D of S, I've assumed to be zero. We're not changing this disturbance. So we're, this part in purple, we've simply forgotten about. But now we're bringing it back and talking about it today. <coughs> So let me quickly show you how you can work with this simulate. Can you copy the last bit down?
Okay, so let's take a look. So far, we're comfortable with what's up here. This is simply the PI controller we saw last time. My process has a gain of three. That three represents the numerator here. Okay. Tau P is the process time constant of two, two S plus one. That was the example I've used in the past. What, earlier this week we derived this PI controller, there's my gain, KC for the controller, KC divided by TI, integral time constant. I'm going to make a change in the set point here, <coughs> cap what we did, so I'm going to step at time 5, and I'm going to ask the control system to increase by 3 degrees Celsius. At time 5, I'd like to make a set point of 3 units, so 3 degrees Celsius in the temperature. I simulate that. The temperature on the output steps at time 5, rises up by 3 degrees, overshoots a little bit to 3.5 degrees Celsius, but then comes back down and stays up 3. So beautiful response, offset 3 with relatively minimal error. Our goal next week is all about how we choose those constants, Kc, Ti, and Td. So for now, let's just simply use these values that I've used, Kc 1.5, Ti 0.5. But let's talk about the disturbance. Well, we haven't added the disturbance in. Let's, let's go do that now. We can go, go to the block diagram and drag in the transfer function for the disturbance. Okay, so well, that's, that's my disturbance. And the numerator here, Kd, the numerator doesn't have to be equal to Kp. But what do we know about KD? It's got to be negative. So let's just put minus 4 there. What do we know about TD? It's 2. Okay, so in this example, to make this example match what we've just developed, there's my disturbance over there. I need to add it in. Well, there's a summation here. I can commonly use blocks. Scroll down, there's a the sum. Okay, now it's not quite the the pluses aren't quite where we need them to be, so double click on it. And you see the vertical pipe <coughs> symbol, this was pipe plus plus. That tells Simulink how to organize the pluses. Just change with the pipe at the end and take it away at the beginning. So it's plus plus pipe, click apply, and it rotates that symbol. So let's bring it in over there, join the process up, join the disturbance up. So we've started my disturbance in the process. Let's close the feedback loop. Okay. Still need to tell the disturbance what, what the disturbance looks like. So the disturbance here is the flow of cold water <coughs> Fc. Okay. Fc is the flow of cold water. I'm going to assume for now, let me go back here, I'm going to turn the set point off. I'm not interested here in, in looking at the set point changes. So initial value is zero, final value is zero. In other words, it's saying keep your temperature constant, but we're going to see what the effect of cold water is. So copy that step over there, join it up. I'm not interested in, I want you to understand what disturbances are going to do first. Then we'll look at combining both together. So I've turned off my set points. I don't want to make a change in temperature. In other words, I'm telling this controller keep temperature fixed. Wherever you were, at zero. Now I'm going to open the cold water. I'm going to step up the cold water. What's going to happen to, happen to the hot water? I manipulated there. You open the cold water, you want to keep the temperature constant. You've got to open the hot water as well. Okay. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to make a change in the cold water temperature at time 15. And I'm going to open that by uh, let's go three units. So simulate that. What do you expect T to be? Before we look at it. So initially T is going to be zero. I'm making a jump in the cold water flow at time 15. So at least up to time from zero to 15, this is going to be a flat line. I'm going to change it. What's going to happen at time 15? going to drop, so I'm feeding cold water in to my tank, and then what's going to happen? 
going to go back up to zero? Is it going to go over and then come back down, or is it just going to come up smoothly? We don't know, because we don't know what the time, what the control loop is going to do. So let's take a look. Simulate that. Okay, so I've asked the control system to keep the temperature constant. Like we said, we dropped 1.4 1, 1 degrees. And then we went up, and we overshot it, and we came back to steady state. Okay, so the way that it does that is totally a function of you, your decision to set KC and TI. If I change KC and I change TI, I'm going to get a different response. You can make this more or less aggressive. We learned about that earlier in the week. Making the response more aggressive and less aggressive by changing KC and TI. Okay, so that's the effect of that, that disturbance over there. Now, we can go add a set point change. So let's go add a set point change back at time 5. I would like to control it to increase the temperature of the tank by 5 degrees. What's that T going to look like now? So I'm asking the controller to make a set point change at time 5. At time 15, I'm going to see this disturbance coming in. What are we going to see over here? Summation of the two. At time 5, what is going to happen to T? going to rise. Because we're asking the set point to increase by 5 degrees at time 5. So it's going to rise. And then it's going to hopefully achieve that goal before time 15 by C. Okay. There we go. It's going to rise 5 degrees, overshoots a little bit, steadies out, and then at time 15, a disturbance is the process. The disturbance <coughs> drops the temperature initially, but the controller gets you back on target again. What is the manipulated variable going to look like? The flow of hot water. It's going to increase and then it's going to increase some more. Alright, let's take a look. Okay. So it increases the temperature on targets, it stays out. And then at time 15, it has to increase some more to counteract the cold So it's increased and then increased a little bit more. So you can play around with this. I'll post this uh, simulation on the website, as I've done with the others previous, and you can try, try and work with it. Now, the last topic I would like to just cover for this morning, and that's going to get us going for next week, is getting you an idea of where we're headed with tuning the controller. Set point change 
little or no overshoot, we're going to quantify that a little bit more and say we would like low error. So we'd like very little error. So that will sum up the overshoot as well. And then finally, a third variable that you may not consider is we want smooth manipulated variable action in the sense that you don't want your valves opening and closing and rapidly. You want smooth manipulated variable behavior. So those are three ways we can judge the performance of our system. Let's just take a look at each one of them in turn. Small manipulated, uh, sorry, small error. So there's several ways we can judge this. Small error. Is the first one. And there's two metrics we can use. The first is the integral absolute error. So this is I A E. Uh, integral absolute error says take the error curve, integrate it, and make sure the absolute value is small. So that is set point as a function of time minus the control variable as a function of time. Take the absolute value of that signal, in other words, take the absolute value of the error and integrate it with respect to time. This simply takes the error under the area curve, under the error curve and sums up above and below. Another one that you'll sometimes see is called the integral squared error. That's called ISE. That's the same idea. Take the integral from 0 to infinity of the set point minus the control variable. Let's square the signal first, and then take the, the, the integration. So you square the signal, and now that does is it penalizes large errors more dramatically. Because you're taking the quadratic, so large errors get penalized more heavily. So those are two ways we can quantify our error. You say to someone, I want a low error, you can go calculate IAE, then go change your KC and TI in your controller, recalculate IAE, and if IAE has dropped, then you've achieved lower error. So these two metrics are two ways that you can quantify error. Settling time. So just a second, we're almost done. So small settling time. What that says is small or short time to achieve a nearly constant final value. Short time to achieve a nearly constant. Typically what we'll do is say it's the time to take to reach plus or minus 5% of your final destination. up next time and uh, what we'll do is we'll show how to derive KC, TI and T values so we can achieve these three goals. That's the focus of next week's class.